Good afternoon. It is the 9th of April already, 2021. Today I'm going to do one that's kind of a follow-on to the last one, and I'm going to entitle this, you know, what are the five areas um, as a federal agent? And this will differ from one agency to another, but I think it applies certainly to the DEA for sure, which is where my experience is, certainly to the FBI, Immigration and Customs Service, ATF, to a lesser extent, the Marshal Service, and um, to a lesser extent, the Secret Service. What are the five areas that tends to uh, damage an agent's career? What are five problem areas, okay? And the first one um, might surprise you, and it's gonna be more prevalent in agencies that have more of these than others, and that is confidential sources. Now, what is a confidential source? They're also called confidential informants, also called confidential witnesses. And by the way, everything that I'm providing in this video is available online uh, to the public uh, through the Office of Inspector General. The uh, United States Department of Justice put out an audit of the DEA's confidential source system. Um, so this is available to anybody on the internet. Uh, although I did, while I was in headquarters, uh, have a large part to do with drafting the DEA confidential source policies back in, this is back in 1999, 2000, and then I went back to an enforcement job. But misconduct with an informant, the confidential source. Um, confidential sources are criminals, okay? They are people who are members of drug trafficking organizations or can very quickly ingratiate themselves or interject themselves into a drug trafficking organization. Now, why can't agents do that? Well, here's why. We come from clean backgrounds, okay? They do backgrounds and polygraphs and all sorts of things to make sure that we're not criminals, okay? If a person were to come in and say, I've got this connection and this drug cartel and this, they wouldn't hire you, okay? Or I've been doing this on the side, I've been transporting drugs, and now I wanna become an agent. No, that's not gonna happen. Now, maybe that person would be able to go right in and do a lot of great undercover, but you know, you don't want a criminal working for you as an agent, you want honest men and women. But informants are by their nature, uh, dishonest people, okay? There may be, I'm, I'm not speaking all 100%, there might be 1% who are good people, but they're turning in their buddies, okay? Be it uh, whether they're organized crime, drug traffickers, uh, people who are engaged in all sorts of things, you know, child pornography, whatever it is. And why would they do this? And there's two basic motivations. One is money. Okay, sometimes they there are a few informants who make a very good living, I would say, from cooperating with the government. Now you have a limited shelf life doing this because sooner or later you're going to have to testify in court. Okay. And I'm going to put up a, a short video just on um, an informant I had, and this is was published in the Miami Herald in 1988, I believe it was. But I'll, we'll see it from the, the news article, and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at this right now. And this is from the uh, UPI archives. It was odd because uh, one morning, my, uh, Sunday morning, my wife woke me up. Your name's in the, the Miami Herald, the Sunday edition. Oh, jeez, you know. But it was over this informant, and uh, of course the press, you know, does not have it totally uh, correct. Certain things they have are correct, you know, but it's about an informant and, uh, you know, who uh, was working for us and, you know, made some money, uh, about close to $80,000, which back then was a lot of money. And he turned in a number of criminals, a number of women, but unfortunately he also uh, engaged in uh, personal relations with them and um, and we, we basically fired him as an informant and uh, you can look this up I'll put the click or the um, the uh, uh, link in the video section but uh, there I go his supervisors no longer use him with my name on there so there you go you know it was uh, not good I didn't not that I got in any trouble for it I didn't Actually, you know, the, the cases and the people that he turned in who cooperated, um, it, you know, they were all good cases. All these people got convicted. It just was that the guy was a scoundrel and uh, 
that you know underscores the um, the general message I think overall is that uh, informants you know they have to be we have to have them but they're also not the pillars of the community how can an informant get you in trouble well every case that I've heard of where a DEA agent went bad uh, it started with an agent agent informant relationship I told you a couple days ago of Sal Martinez who is a convicted felon who hired an informant of his to commit a murder. He was assigned to Mexico, an office, a DEA overseas office in Mexico, and one of his relatives had been killed by a 13-year-old boy in El Paso. But the kid was eventually released because he was only 13. And what this guy did is he hired a Mexican police officer to kill a 13-year-old. Well, what did the Mexican police officer do? He went to the FBI and told them, I can sell you a DEA agent, and he did. And uh, he made a lot of money off of it. And Mr. Martinez went to prison and lost his job. So he went to, he got seven years behind bars. So again, uh, a lot of the bad stuff that happens, happens as a result of agents and informants. So there are strict rules with regards to informants. Two agents have to be present or an agent and a police officer are always present whenever you deal with them. You never have any personal relationships with them, romantic business or otherwise. You don't take any gifts from them. Uh, the other reason people inform, of course, is they're in trouble, you know, defendants. And defendants tend to be the best informants, okay, because they're working off a of beef and they have to provide good stuff in order to stay out of jail. An informant for pay will do things to try to minimize his or her risk. Uh, um, so, again, informants can get you in trouble. The second one that can get you in trouble shouldn't be a big surprise to anybody, and that's alcohol. Um, now, when I came on DEA in 1985, 1986, alcohol flowed freely. And uh, the most egregious case I saw of this, uh, one of these agents who had been on forever uh, was a known alcoholic and had been disciplined, been thrown out of country. Uh, when he was overseas, actually killed another DEA agent in a drunken stupor. Yeah. Driving home, driving the agent was driving him home. He was passed out cold for drunk from the Christmas party. He came to and he shot the agent numerous times and killed him. And of course, he got fired. He got 15 years in Florida State Prison. The man's name, who who was the killer, Dick Facchetti, alcoholic. Um, just, you know, not a, not a good person. And that is why the DEA has such uh, strict requirements uh, with regards to consumption of alcohol, because you always have to be prepared to go back to duty. Uh, there was a purge, we would say, from 1994 to about 2001, where the Office of Professional Responsibility, that's our internal affairs, uh, headhunters, uh, if you want to call them that, they went after a lot of people and either forced retirements or got them out of the agency. People who were problems. So informants, alcohol. The third thing you might not think of, but it's tied to alcohol, and that's the official government car. As an agent, uh, DEA, FBI, Secret Service, ATF, um, ICE, you're going to have a take-home car. Okay. Now that car can be used to go to and from work and to report to work. And really, your, your car is your office. Is a GS-13 or below. Your car is your office. Uh, now, why do you need a take-home car? Because you're, you're on call. You might get the call, like, this is Friday afternoon. Let's, let's say it was a Saturday. I could get a call on my cell phone and say, at 4 a.m. tomorrow, we need to report to a, we're going to meet up at a parking lot of a fire station at such and such location in Hyattsville, Maryland, because we're serving a search warrant at dawn. Okay, so that's why you have a take-home car, and that's why you receive availability pay. Uh, but, but again, with the car comes problems sometimes. The biggest problem, alcohol and driving. People stop off for one, and one becomes two, and two becomes four, and the police don't play that game anymore. Okay, so they just as soon arrest a federal agent as they would anyone else. Now, going back 30 years, maybe they'd let you go. You know, and they'd have, they call your supervisor to take you home, but they don't do that anymore. And it's good that they don't do that anymore. Okay, I don't support them doing that. 
The second thing that people would tend to do in their government car is transport, in other words, use it without authorization, and that is transport family members. You can't even take your child to school in the government car. You know? Um, there's things that you can't do. You can't do personal business in the government car. Now, if you're at work, that's a different thing. You know, you're on surveillance, you got to go get a hamburger. Obviously, you can do that. If you're at work and, you know, I got to go pick up my dry cleaning, that is a different thing. But you can't, on your day off, get in your government car and drive to the 7-Eleven. You have to use your own car. You got to have your own car. You can't use the government's car. That's, uh, you know, and, and that's because uh, it could become could be construed as income actually if, if you were allowed to do that which it isn't uh, it's a tool that's an investigative tool agents and headquarters except for the administrator and the top bigwigs do not have government cars you have to drive your own vehicle to and from work or carpool or take a train or whatever because you're not an investigative agent you're not working on the street but when you're working on the street that's a great benefit you get a take-home car but at the same time, it can get you in trouble, you know. If you mix alcohol and driving, if you're transporting family members on your day off to the beach, big problem. You know, if there's dog hair in your car and you're not a canine officer, you know, that's a big problem. Um, those type of things, you know. The fourth thing, um, associations with bad people. And again, as part of of DEA you have to associate with confidential sources but if you have family members who are criminals this presents a huge problem um, this has happened before uh, it happened to a, um, a customs or a ICE officer who I cited in the last video Miss Deese Giovanna Deese whose sister was a comandante in the Mexican Federal Judicial Police what's so bad about that well in and of itself nothing but in some, in case, some cases, blood is thicker than water, okay? And if you have criminals who are family members, that's why in the SF-86, it has tons of pages about your family members now. They want to know this. But in some cultures, in some families, you know, it, it's, it's thick. And I even brought up in the last video the, the example of my former, a former task force officer and a group that I supervised. She ran some un unauthorized information on her brother and gave up a case. Now this is very dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because, you know, um, the inf this isn't classified material, but you can get someone killed a lot quicker. Because if there's an informant in the case, it's not hard usually, usually to figure out who the informant is. Especially if they can run off police reports and get them to you. Yeah, there's a coded number for the informant's name, but if it says such and such number met with John Doe, and you're John Doe on such and such a day, such a, you don't have to be a genius to figure out such and such coded number is whoever he is or she is, and then you can kill that person if you want to. So, I mean, these are very serious things. That's why they look at associations, family members very closely. Um, certainly bad judgment is another one. And usually this goes with alcohol and um, yeah, it flows with alcohol. A lot of times it'll start, someone is on TDY and they're in a bar, they're temporary on duty. They're not with their car, but they're carrying their gun and their badge and they're drinking in a bar and somebody wants to come out and fight them or whatever. Okay, the first question is, what are you doing? Why are you under the influence? Why are you carrying a weapon under the influence? Um, but these are the first questions that are going to come out, no matter what happens. Now, we had a case in Colombia several years ago where, you know, and our administrator got brought before Congress and questioned, and I'm going to put that video on. Well, involving U.S. drug enforcement agents seems to be getting worse by the day. A report made public today by the House Oversight Committee says that American taxpayers footed the bill for sex parties in Colombia. Chip Reed is following this. You have no control over the security clearance. What the hell do you get to do? In a sometimes explosive hearing, Democrat Elijah Cummings said the Drug Enforcement Agency is completely out of control. They appear to have paid for prostitutes with no concern whatsoever for the negative repercussions of security vulnerabilities they created. Republican Stephen Lynch. They're using taxpayer money to solicit and pay for prostitutes. And you're very disappointed, you're not happy. 
On the hot seat, I, DEA I Administrator that. Michelle Leonhardt, who's held the job since 2007. Unfortunately, poor choices made by a few individuals can tarnish the reputation and overshadow the outstanding work being done at the DEA. According to the new report, the DEA sex parties in Colombia began in 2001 and are believed to have ended in 2008. It was daily routine, according to the report, for operational budgets to use leftover money to hire prostitutes. Seven agents who admitted participating in sex parties received suspensions of just one to ten days. Committee Chairman Jason Chaffetz was furious that agents haven't been fired. You allow this person who engages a prostitute throws glass at her, breaks the skin, there's blood all over the place, and they're still employed at the DEA? Leonhardt noted there was little she could do because of civil service protections for federal workers. I assure you that I was quite disappointed in the penalties imposed. Last week, Attorney General Eric Holder put out a memo reminding department employees that paying a prostitute for sex is a violation of department policy. Well, today, Scott, some members of Congress said it's a sad state of affairs when federal law enforcement agents need to be reminded of that. Chip Reed on Capitol Hill for us tonight. Chip, thanks very much. You can see that um, those areas, confidential sources, abuse of alcohol, government cars, associations, bad judgment. These things will get you in trouble. They will blacken the reputation of the agency. So what should you do? You know, try to go as by the book as you can, you know. Go to church every Sunday if you're Christian. If you're Jewish, go to the synagogue. If you're Muslim, go to the mosque. If you're nothing at all, do some meditating. But try to do something that breaks you away from the law enforcement environment. Work out, you know. And remember why you joined, you know, remember why you joined and remember that, you know, no matter, even if you get away with something, you know, somebody sees you and that's God, right? God is always watching, but not only God, you know, other people are watching too, you know, and uh, I think if your heart is in the right place, you want to do the right thing, and especially if you get promoted to supervisory rank, I think a lot of the things that I've cited, they're in the agency's past although they'll come up again and again as time goes on. So hopefully this has been a little bit uh, light for a Friday. I don't know. Um, the next uh, video will be how to get promoted in the federal system. Okay, have a good one. Thank you.